Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Well, today uh, we are right in the middle of the Fruits of Freedom series, and we're going to specifically be looking at the fruit of the freedom of goodness, or the fruit of the Spirit. It always amazes me, because we are talking about the Holy Spirit, that He actually resides in us. Isn't that an amazing mystery, that the God of the universe, He comes and resides in people if you've given your life to Jesus. That truth is absolutely astonishing. And he guides us, he leads us when he lives in us. And sometimes we can ignore this guidance. We can ignore these promptings in our lives. As a parent, I get what it's like to be ignored. We have a three-year-old son, a toddler, and he sometimes likes to ignore me. Um, how many people have ever tried to potty train a kid before? It is horrible. It is one of the worst experiences of my entire life. And sometimes it's even worse when you have to actually uh, leave the house, and because they have to go to the bathroom when you leave the house too. And uh, Heather and I were at a wedding, and, um, and Eli comes up to me, and he's like, P-Dad, P-Dad. And when he says that, immediately, you have, to, you have to drop everything you're doing, stop who you're talking to, and take him to the bathroom, or it's going to be too late. And we know what happens when it's too late. So we go to the bathroom, and this is, I think, the first time I actually took Eli into a bathroom. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to do, so I see a urinal. I was like, all right, let's try this. We haven't done this before, but there's a, no better time to learn than now. Um, so I, I put him in front of it, and the very first thing he does, he reaches his hand inside and grabs the urinal cake. A blue, disgusting, wet urinal cake. Oh, I, I immediately started gagging, and I was like, all right, the urinal was not a good idea, so I take him into the stall, and I'm just begging him. I'm like, Eli, please don't touch anything. Uh, please don't touch your face. Don't put your hands in your mouth. Please please don't. So I put him up there. I turn my head for a second, and then all of a sudden, I feel fingers go in my mouth. He put his urinal pee fingers in my mouth. He ignored what I said, and sometimes we can ignore things the Holy Spirit says also. The Holy Spirit is like a spiritual GPS. If we were going to type a destination into a map, into the search bar, it would not be a place, but a person. The Holy Spirit wants to make us look like Jesus. Uh, that is the purpose. So how does that happen? How do we know if we are being guided by the Holy Spirit? Well, uh, there are a couple things we can look at. The Holy Spirit guides us away from sin and into the truth. So if you're guided by the Holy Spirit, you're being uh, kind of led away from sin, led away from being bad, and you're kind of being guided into what is good and what is true. The Holy Spirit guides us into being more like Jesus. And ask the question of yourself. Last year, if you go back a year from this time, are you more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Is the Holy Spirit doing work in your life? Is He constantly moving? Is He constantly speaking to you? And um, I think it's important to mention that whenever we talk about rules and things we do and things we shouldn't do here in church, it's important to note that the rules, the, the stuff we do and don't do, it, those will not make you right with God. You could follow every single rule in the Bible, and those will not make you right with God. Jesus is the only way to get right with God. And then as a result of that, because we are thankful and because of everything he has done for us, then we follow those rules. And then we love him. I often think of it like this. Um, when you get married, you often go into a set of rules. Like, you know, you're supposed to love the other person. You're not supposed to cheat on the other person. And there are kind of unwritten rules of marriage. Imagine for a second that if you went into marriage and said, well, I have to do this or I have to do that. That would be absolutely insane, wouldn't it? We do it, we follow these rules because we love the other person. It's the same with God. We follow these rules because we love God. So the question today is, the Holy Spirit guiding you on the path of goodness? If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 25. 
Uh, we're going to be starting in the ESV, and then we're going to switch translations um, after I finish this, and we're going to read the same thing in a, the message translation. So if you have the iPhone or the Uversion app on the Bible, um, get ready to switch. And it says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rival rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Not exactly, but things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Very strong language right here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Isn't that a cool picture that those who belong to Jesus have taken, uh, Jesus has taken the stuff off of us and, and crucified it with him? That, that's, that's a really neat picture in my head. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in spirit keeping with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we're, we're going to now switch to the message translation, and what I like about this, it kind of expands on the words that are already there, because it's easy for us to look at that, that list of the bad stuff and say you know, that, that I've never really done any of those things, or maybe one or two of them, but um, let's look at the expanded uh, version of this. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All-consuming yet never satisfied once a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of the community. I could go on. This is not the first time I've warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way. See the contrast? What happens when we live our way? What happens when we live God's way? Here's what happens when we live God's way. He brings gifts into our lives much the same way fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved, involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way, and that's cool. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. See, I, I like that expanded because it kind of just, it kind of just takes that verse and kind of makes it grow a little bit, and it's really neat. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, one of the fruits of the spirit, goodness. And today we're going to look at three truths about goodness. So if you have your outline, if you have the bulletin, and you want to follow along and fill in the blanks, truth number one: goodness ultimately comes from God. Goodness ultimately comes from God. And that is a simple fact. God is good, and he is good all the time. No matter what you are going through in your life, no matter what this country is going through, God is good. No matter if you live for another week or you live for a hundred more years, God is good. No matter what happens in this world, to this universe, whatever it might be, God is always good, and he was good a million years ago, and he's going to be good a million years from now. This is one of the first things we are taught as kids, some of us, uh, that prayer. Did, did anybody learn that prayer, God is good, God is great, anybody? Um, we had a couple people from the first service. But yeah, that is one of the first things that uh, we learn, this prayer, that this, this basic goodness of God. Psalm 119.68 says this, You are good 
and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees in Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And it's funny because goodness does not come naturally to us. In fact, going back and having a toddler, uh, you have to teach toddlers to be good or else they'll, they'll begin to not want to share and they'll begin to say that two-letter word, no. Uh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> but yeah, it, it doesn't come naturally to us and uh, we have to be taught to be good. In fact, the Bible says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And again, in Romans 3, it says, as it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. So nobody is naturally good, and we each need God to give us his goodness. So where does this good goodness come from? Well, fortunately, he has an abundance of goodness. Psalm 31, 19 says this, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children and of mankind. It's a, such a cool picture of this goodness that God has, and he has it built up. He has a storehouse of goodness, and he wants just to uh, give us this goodness so we can give it to other people. The very simple fact of it is that we must allow God to work us. So are you allowing God to work through you on a daily basis? And more importantly, can other people see God working through you on a daily basis? It often floors me when I see these massive acts of forgiveness by people. Um, one I saw last year is Pastor Davy Blackburn. It happened last November. Um, his wife, his pregnant wife, uh, was killed and assaulted by burglars and you know, the human part of me, the humanity part of me says, you know what, we need revenge, something needs to be done. Uh, but he ended up forgiving them. And that wasn't him. That wasn't his human nature forgiving the killers of his wife and unborn kid. That was God. And also, um, not too long ago, Nadine Collier, daughter of Ethel Lance, who was killed in the Charleston church shootings, um, her mom was killed, and she got to um, kind of be face-to-face -face with the shooter, and this is what she said. I forgive you. You took something very precious from me, and I will never talk to her again. I will never, ever hold her again, but I forgive you. You know, that is an incredible work of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if I could do that. I really don't. But I know God can, and he lives inside of everyone who's given our life to Jesus. So we have that in us. We have the goodness in us. In a book, Forgotten God by Francis Chan, if you want a good book by the whole, about the Holy Spirit, this is it right here. Um, check it out. It's pretty cheap on Amazon now. Um, he says this, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want people to look at my life and know that I couldn't be doing this on my own power. I don't believe God wants me or any of his children to live in a way that makes sense from the world's perspective, a way I know I can manage. I believe he is calling me and all of us to depend on him for living in a way that cannot be mimicked or forged. He wants us to walk in step with his spirit rather than depend solely on the raw talent and knowledge he has given us. So when people see you, do they see a human effort or are they seeing something that only God could do? Truth number two, goodness means building up and serving others. Goodness means building up and serving others. And this was perfectly exemplified in Jesus. Uh, the Bible says he did not come to be served, uh, he did not come to be served, but to serve. And if God came not to be served, but to serve, then we all should, should do the same thing. Um, our church mission is love God, serve others, share your story. This is the central mission, the central idea of what our church um, should be about, serving other people. If you look at the basic definition of goodness, it's this, building up others and putting others' needs ahead of your own. I saw this displayed perfectly 
last Monday. Uh, the youth had a trip to the beach water park. Uh, we met Monday. All the kids were ready. Uh, they all had their swimsuits on, towels ready, backpacks ready to go. Um, I go out to the bus um, to start it up, and I notice it has a flat tire. And I was like, oh, man, of course it does, um, because we've had some bus troubles on a couple trips here and there, and it seems like it always happens to me and nobody else, and it's just, <laughs> but I, I, so I call over to SNW, uh, the, the car place over here, I was like, can you fix this? Can you do this for us? Um, uh, we're leaving in like 30 minutes. Uh, we need something right now. And he's like, yeah, I'll see what I can do. So he comes over and he looks at it, and a couple minutes later we get a call back, and he's like, we have some bad news. Uh, the tire's not going to be blown back up because it was cut. So the, the bus was vandalized, and it, I told the youth this, and they were devastated because we weren't going to be able to go. Um, we didn't have enough cars to take them. So Charles Wilson and I, um, we began calling people. And one of the first few people I called was Melanie Holton. Is she in this service? She was in the earlier service. I think she took up the offering. But um, she, I called her, and I was like, Melanie, here's what's going on. The bus tire is cut. We need one more car to take us up. I was like, what are you doing right now? She was like, I'm working. I was like, oh, no. So I was like, if anybody was going to do it, it would be her. And um, then she said something. She was like, but count on me. I'll do it. She left work in the middle of the day just to drive us up to the water park. And then she was like, what time are you going to leave? I'll be there to pick you guys up. That is putting other people's needs ahead of your own. Very cool. Philippians 2.4 says, let, us each, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Before I got a job here, I was um, a college student and a youth leader at First Baptist Church Cold Spring. Um, the youth pastor time, he came when um, the youth group was uh, a little dysfunctional and there was a lot of gossip going on, a lot of talking and about other people. And he came into this and he kind of fixed the problem and he had this motto. Um, it was this, build up or shut up. Build up or shut up. It was, it's very forceful in a way, but it was needed at the time. And it basically means this, if you are not building somebody up, if you are not lifting somebody up, putting their needs ahead of your own, then it should not come out of your mouth, period. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And then Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And check this out, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. So we're supposed to go out into the world and do good to everyone. Yes, Jesus says to love our enemies. That is very true. But this verse, it says you are to do good to everyone, especially the people around you right now. So a challenge this week for you guys is to find somebody within this building, find somebody within our church to lift up, to build up. And then once you've done that, find somebody outside of the church to build up, to lift up, to put their needs above your needs. Simple challenge. Idea number three, practice goodness daily. Practice goodness daily. So how is this done? Well, three ways to get this done. First way, get in the habit of saying, I am third. Get in the habit of saying, I am third. If you look at your church bulletin, you will see um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you divide these up into threes, the first three deal with God, the next three, patience, kindness, and goodness, deal with others, and the final three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, deal with you. And this is how we should view life. We should put God first, love God first, put others second, and then you being number three, yourself. Put you last, third. Imagine what the world would look like if everybody did this. It'd be different, wouldn't it? Second way to do this is go to God daily. And we do this two ways, prayer and God's word. And I don't want to sound Sunday school answerist, but this, this, is, this, is, this, is, what, this is what it is. Um, 
prayer is this direct connection to God, okay? Let me say that again, because it, you, got, you obviously all weren't floored by this. We have a direct line to God, God of the universe. We can talk to him right now, the one who created everything. We can speak to him right now. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. Are you connecting with him on a daily basis in prayer? God's word. Are you connecting with his word every single day? When people come up to me and say, I haven't heard God speak in my life, I don't know what's going on, the first question I always ask is, are you reading the Bible? Because this is primarily, not the only way, but primarily how he speaks to us today, his word. And if you are not hearing from God, then there's a good chance you're not reading his word, because he is going to speak to that, speak through that to you. So go to God daily, pray, and get into his word every single day. Finally, find someone to confide in daily. Find someone to confide in daily. And you can do this a couple ways. First, find a group to join. We have Sunday school classes here that, that primarily focus on Bible study. And in a couple weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot about small groups. Um, the idea of it is to join a smaller group outside of this congregation to live life together with and to study the Bible. So join a group. If you're not involved in a group, then you're not getting in church. You're not getting this to your full potential. Find an individual to confide in. It's important for each of us to have one person in our lives that we can go to with our problems and uh, just whatever's going on in our lives. Uh, make it, if you're a guy, let it be another guy. If you're a girl, let it be another girl. And find one individual that you can trust to confide in. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So today, the challenge is simple. Allow the Holy Spirit to live through you. Use not your own goodness, but God's goodness. Because your goodness will run out. God's goodness is abundance, and it will not.